And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sipshan people. With a background in public relations, economic development, wealth management, and banking, Lana Eagle is an indigenous relations strategist and a social innovator. We begin today's Open Connection with highlights of her talk during the Nation to Nation conference in Prince Rupert. A lot has happened and is happening in our country today, um, not only Canada-wide, but in the province of BC, where we're working to build relationships with each other. Some are doing it quite successfully and some still have a ways to go. But I think, you know, what really, uh, for me as an Indigenous woman, working in the mineral exploration and mining sectors here in um, Canada, um, I think people had a very academic understanding of what the need for truth and reconciliation and to, to work inside of a, a reconciliation framework. And it wasn't until the unmarked graves were discovered across Canada, beginning in Kamloops, that people's eyes really began to open up. And a friend of mine working in a different sector, you know, got a call from her president and CEO asking, how come I don't know about this? When in fact, truth and reconciliation was a topic of, topic of conversation in boardrooms and um, employee, um, with employee groups, you know, and, and people still didn't really understand it, but it was this discovery that really opened people's eyes. So it was amazing the kind of, um, um, I guess, people wanting to know more. So that year in 2021, or I guess 2022, I get mixed up with my years now that we're out of the pandemic. But in 20, no, it was 2021, the first um, uh, national day of truth and reconciliation in, in Canada that many employee groups, many companies contacted me to speak to their employees of the need for reconciliation in Canada. So so what came of that, I think, is a real eye-opening experience. Many Canadians, people in our age group who attended school in Canada, had never heard about truth and reconciliation or what happened to Indigenous people. And, you know, are approaching this with their eyes wide open now. And I think I'm starting to see a change. And for me personally, when that, when the graves were being discovered, I became very angry and very hurt. And it, what it took for me to sort of come out of it was uh, Chief Dr. Robert Joseph, for some of you may know, who um, is a founder of Reconciliation Canada. Their organization began to have discussions with all kinds of people, all kinds of Canadians, whether we're Indigenous or not Indigenous, whether we're newcomers or we're born here, people joined in on these calls to to express how they felt and to talk about how we can come out of this and what that started to really mean. And that really touched me. And I think for me, it began a journey of healing, probably not thinking that I needed to be so much on a journey of healing, but I realized that I had to heal from the hurt. And it took me a while, but here I am today still talking about reconciliation and the need for it. So last week I had to make a trip to Ottawa for, for business reasons. And we met with all kinds of people in the natural resource sector with NRCAN and, and different groups associated with it, the envi environmental um, groups and so on to talk about Geoscience BC in Canada, or yeah, in Canada actually. And Geoscience BC is a not-for-profit organization of which I am a director. And we started talking about, you know, the technical side and, and met with scientists and that sort of thing. But on the very last day, we had a meeting with NRCAN, which is Natural Resource Canada, talking about Indigenous, um, why Indigenous people are important to what we're trying to do here in Geoscience BC. And one of our first um, people that we met with came to the meeting and she's a scientist. Um, and she expressed to me how important it is to the Geological Survey of Canada. So they sit there with thousands, hundreds of thousands of samples. And as you may or may not know, Canada has a critical mineral strategy. And part of that strategy 
is advancing um, reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples. Um, and what she said was, you know, what they've decided to do is to, um, before they start uh, re-evaluating um, these samples, to look for critical minerals. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. A pioneer for Aboriginal women in being one of the first to chair a mineral exploration company in Canada, Electric Gold Limited, she now advises companies on how to better advise and work with Indigenous communities. Let us return to the conversation with Lana Eagle. What they decided they wanted to do was to contact each nation where these samples were taken from and get their permission to move forward. And that really touched my heart because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, um, reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous people is very much a political policy. But what is happening is it's moving into the bureaucratic ranks and into the different agencies in Canada. And they are beginning to find a way to move forward to work with Canada's Indigenous peoples. And when I say that, I don't mean we belong to Canada. I, I'm saying that as sort of a broad group. And so with critical minerals, if we want to get to net zero by 2050, we need certain minerals to help with that energy transition. So Canada defined 31 critical minerals and they're all located here in Canada and to bring us sort of to move that along. But in my mind, I'm wondering how can we do this without continuing to engage and engage in a meaningful way with, with Indigenous peoples across Canada. So I would say about a year and a half ago, I was contacted by a group out of Europe, European, um, a European capital company who have several different um, mineral exploration companies across the globe. And the one that's focused here in Canada is called Superior Nickel. And they began to do a desktop survey of where they should actually explore in Canada. And it turns out that the nickel belt in Manitoba extends beyond Thompson out towards Hudson's Bay. And then if you come on the other side of Hudson's Bay, it goes into Northern Quebec and Labrador. So they determined this is where they'd like to explore. So in order for that to happen, they brought me in to help them work with um, Indigenous people in Northern Manitoba. Their context and their history is very different from those here in BC. And so they have, I would say, a very, not a very good working relationship with the Manitoba government. But in order for the Manitoba government to make themselves the best jurisdiction, you know, globally to explore, they're putting themselves out there as, you know, we have strong working relationships with Indigenous people. And sad to say, they don't, from the Indigenous perspective. And a lot of that um, feeling of um, not being um, considered important to all of this is how they've treated people through the Manitoba Hydro expansion of damming rivers and lakes and creating all, all kinds of... Um, of situations where water is toxic to communities, where they're not being listened to, there a lot of promises are being made, but they're they're not being um, they're not living up to their promises. So it's a very, very um, fractious relationship, and so so that's what we kind of stepped into when we began talking to and early engaging with Indigenous people, and. It's been a learning experience, but I think for, for me, my team is um, a geologist from the UK and um, someone working in sustainability from the Netherlands. And these are two young, very impressionable, very sensitive guys. And they want to know how can we do this? How can we work with indigenous people? So what we've done is we've done community visits and we're, and we're building those relationships at the very ground level where we have elders talking to us, telling their stories, where we have children wanting to learn more about who we are. And it's just been, it's just been so good. We've got a lot of uh, challenges ahead of us, but certainly we've started out in the very right way. So when I speak of reconciliation, how we move forward, 
it is about those early conversations. It is about engagement. It is about finding out what are the issues of communities and what are the um, the aspirations of communities. So on another project that I'm working on, um, we are speaking and engaging with a community here in BC. And, and what is important to them? Two things, climate change and water. So we weren't, I would honestly say, we weren't prepared for the climate change concern, but we have said that we would go and uh, research what that potentially could mean to them should we go forward, should they let us go forward with exploration and, and, and how we can address their issues and their concerns. So people talk about climate change and, and we know there's um, COP27, I believe it is going on in Egypt right now and, and how are we gonna move forward? Um, but I think we need to hear from Canada's indigenous peoples how we should move forward and what it means to them and water is an extremely important issue. So we have to be prepared to to have those conversations and to um, to answer any of their concerns and to address any of their issues. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Every entrepreneur knows that first impressions are important, but you may not know how little time you actually have to make one. Within the first seven seconds of a meeting, people will have a solid impression on who you are. Let's return the conversation with Lana. Not only are we engaging early, we're striving to build trust can they trust you as an industry person can they build a relationship with you as an industry and i think those are important questions and so really after all the years that i've been working in this area it comes down to people it comes down to who you send to have those discussions with people and i really believe that not everyone is is cut for this kind of these kinds of decisions, these kinds of engagements, because it does take someone that can listen and someone that can um, respond in a way that helps people, helps Indigenous people to build that trust in you. And so when they start to, um, to, to share, they're not going to tell you everything right at the outset, but they start to share and, and feel that they, they can share with you. And it's really touching to hear some of their stories and in ways that they've been treated in the past by industry, by government. And yes, you're not responsible for that, but in some way you are responsible because you can help them heal from those past um, experiences. So in Canada, there are some really good examples of companies that are working in this area and are working quite well. Long before, um, Reconciliation was even defined in 2015 by the final report that came out, which is very a very deep report and very um, sad to hear some of the stories that people experienced attending Canada's residential schools being ripped apart from their families with their language and culture taken away from them so that they can become um, more assimilated to um, to the European lifestyle, I guess. But we are a people that, that have endured this, and we are people that um, can, can come through this. And now we're talking about things like economic reconciliation. And I think in some ways, and my thoughts are, you know, yes, we need to find a way to include Indigenous people in our projects in a meaningful way. But I think that what we really need to do is to be able to find out from them how do we do that and it is about having those meaningful conversations because if we don't we're just going in with hey we can offer you training and jobs and then can we really do that or will we really do that you know it's more than about training and jobs it's about an acknowledgement of the people an acknowledgement of their past and their history and finding a way to move forward and until we're really ready to do that we may have some sort of social license to operate for that time period that we've maybe been able to um, convince the chief and council that this is what is needed 
and when when the next um, election cycle comes along, some of them may run on the on the platform of we're going to get rid of all um, projects in their territory, and that has happened in in a territory in um, Ontario where there's mining taking place, and and then a chief and council won their um, election by saying they're going to get rid of all development in their territory. And so anyone new coming to that territory wanting to explore has been met with no. And of course, because it's kind of confrontational, the government just kind of steps back because they don't want to become involved in this confrontation. And so everything stops for a couple of years. The mine can continue to mine, but you know, expansion is, is difficult because there, the exploration has proven that there are more resources in the ground, but they can't mine it because the nation has said no more development in our territory. And so, so we get to these crossroads sometimes where, where things are difficult and things are challenging and we may not achieve the social license to operate, but it all goes back to you and how you approach communities and how you make that commitment to be that change maker. And that takes courage because at that time when you're wanting to move forward and wanting to find a way to work with communities, it may not necessarily be to um, satisfy your shareholders. And that's probably the main reason why companies do what they do. It's because we have shareholders that, that feel that, you know, we need to expand, we need to get more out of the ground, we need to build our pipelines, we need to build our LNG plants. And at that same time, we may not necessarily have the approval, the permission for the social license to operate from communities. So getting in on the ground is, is, is so important and building that trust. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. According to their website, the Government of Canada is working to advance reconciliation and renew the relationship with Indigenous peoples based on recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. In this final segment of Open Connection, Lana shares how we can move forward. So when we talk about reconciliation, and I, and I said this earlier, we may talk about economic reconciliation because somehow that, that's a little easier to digest because we can go in and we can provide training and jobs and opportunities for um, procurement. But sometimes the real challenge is, is the history and how people are have lived through it and continue to survive. but there are social issues. And, and sometimes we just don't want to deal with that. It's, that is the tough part. And how do we move forward? So, so for instance, in, on the, in the Manitoba project, um, when we enter into the community, there's a gate and there are security guards. And um, this was all set up during the pandemic, but now there's a sign out that says, um, bootleggers and drug dealers are not welcome but probably in a little stronger terms than that. And, but you know, they're trying to find a way to, to deal with, with a situation on the ground where there are high levels of addictions and, um, and alcohol abuse and, and all the other social issues that, that surround that. And that may not necessarily be who they are as a people, but it certainly has affected them. And so, if that is the kind of situation that you're you're getting into, I think before you even begin to ask those questions, so I hear you have a high addiction problem here and start off a conversation that way, I think it is about building trust so, so they feel they can share with you what their challenges are and what might help them um, change those challenges and change what's happening on the ground in their communities. So when I presented here in um, Terrace, as I was saying earlier, I talked about the elephant in the room and it was amazing how many um, elders who were in attendance came to me afterwards and thanked me for talking about the elephant in the room because I think that is the most important thing. It, it comes with the federal government um, engaging with indigenous communities across Canada, 
especially in those areas where there could be critical minerals that are in, that are of value in you know to create a net zero society. And and it doesn't then um, abrogate from a, um, a, a industry engaging with First Nation communities. So so we all have a responsibility in this. And I think um, if we can take that approach, we start to build reconciliation, maybe without, you know, going in saying, hey, we're here to be a reconciliation partner. We just begin to to include them in our conversations. We begin to um, engage with Indigenous people meaningfully. We And being inclusive means we make people feel like they really do belong. A friend of mine in the industry um, explaining inclusion says it's like being invited to a party but also being asked to dance you're not just not showing up at a party and being ignored it, it's about being asked to dance and and we have to be prepared to do that for those of you in industry i think what you will un- begin to understand is having meaningful relationships with indigenous people in a reconciliation framework increases the value of your company because this is what ESG, even though ESG doesn't really have an indigenous component, it was brought together by um, investors looking at climate change. Even though indigenous people are concerned about climate change, um, the indigenous component is um, fairly well ignored in, in ESG, but there are there is a group in Canada, First, Nation, First Nations Major Projects Coalition, that is striving to to move that forward to include indigenous people and how important that is. But um, yeah, it, um, I kind of forgot my train of thought there, but it is really important to um, to be inclusive so that indigenous people feel like they belong. And then I look at other groups like the Taltan, for instance, they have their protocols. They have defined, if you want to do business with us, this is what you must do. And they've been very successful at doing that. And I think they could almost have that same kind of conversation with the province of BC. If you want to do business with us, this is what you must do. That to me is amazing that a, that a nation can get to that point where they have a lot of, I'm going to use the word power in a very positive way, that they know who they are. And when we can recognize that nations know who they are and that we must listen to them in order to move forward, that to me is another um, way that we can recognize what reconciliation is. So another friend of mine defined reconciliation as finding a way forward. So it can never be completely one way or completely the other way, but it is about two people coming together and finding a way forward with respect, with transparency, and with honor, and with understanding, and with compassion and with finding ways that we can be responsible and we can work together. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.